Welcome to Volleyball State. Your look at volleyball in six rotations. Here are your hosts, Jeff Sheldon and Lincoln Arneal. Hello and welcome to Volleyball State, a look at the sport of volleyball in six rotations, a proud part of the Herd at Sports family. I'm Jeff Sheldon, joined today as always, Lincoln Arneal. And our show goes in a lot of different directions today. We're going to recap Nebraska's spring match exhibition over the weekend against Denver and see where the Huskers are going to be at going into the summer. We're coming down to the end of the first season of the Pro Volleyball Federation and the Omaha Supernovas are headed to the playoffs. We've got a fun talk with Renee Saunders, the head coach of the Omaha Scut Nebraska High School Dynasty, who is also the radio color analyst for the Supernovas. So we go in a couple different directions with her. And of course, we're going to be talking about the big story, the kind of the cloud that's hanging over the Nebraska volleyball program at the moment, the Harper Murray situation. But first, Lincoln, Arneo, let's tell the folks where they can interact with us, find us online, hook up with us. Yes, you can uh, find us on uh, social media. We're on Twitter at Volleyball Pod. Uh, we're also on t t TikTok as well, too. We put out little clips of our uh, it material so look for us there if you want to email us email us at volleyballstate at gmail.com and also you can uh, contact me at lincoln underscore vb on twitter and read all of my day-to-day -day coverage of nebraska volleyball at huskers illustrated jeff where can they find you um in my basement most of the time um in a car with multiple uh, car seats in it but i guess digitally you can find me on social media at by jeff sheldon on twitter um you know we were able to follow along or i was able to follow along um the the spring match on uh, on saturday out in carney lincoln you were out there uh what was it? we're going to talk about the environment we're going to talk about everything we saw from that match uh coming up here in just a little bit anything big you're working on in your all of your writing credits whether it's huskers illustrated volleyball mag anything that the people should be looking for in the next couple of weeks well it's i mean the, the volleyball uh the, the volleyball spring season's over so i'm going to actually start working on my uh 2024 previews of nebraska and all of the big 10 so that'll come out in uh, July, June, July will be our big summer edition with uh, Husker Illustrated puts together a great magazine. So a lot of football content, but also a lot of volleyball content. So I'm already looking forward to the fall. So that'll, that'll, that'll be my next couple of, uh, weeks. you've already got your all big 10 and your, your national title picks probably put together. Haven't you? Uh, that'll be my task over the next few weeks. So yes. Huh. You look, all so. right. So we've got a lot of Husker stuff um, with the spring match and kind of looking at positions and everything coming up here in just a little bit. We are going to start, however, in rotation one um, with, with the situation that's developed over the last month with one of Nebraska volleyball's biggest stars, and that's Harper Murray, the sophomore-to-be outside hitter who had a great freshman season last year but has uh, made headlines for, for the wrong reasons in the offseason. Uh, during our last show, we talked about uh, Harper being – uh, cited for for driving under the influence back in early April near the UNL campus. It was for that that she was suspended for the spring match. She did not play in Saturday's match against Denver. And then last week, um, it was revealed that Lincoln Police uh, is investigating her for for shoplifting from Shields, a Lincoln Sportigan store, on Thursday, May second. Um, Facebook has a description of the incident along with some photos that a uh, as someone who claimed to be an employee of Shields posted some screenshots from a what they said was a surveillance video, and uh, the Lincoln police are investigating that. Um, and so, you know, this is this is not what you want to see, obviously, from from anyone, but certainly one of your presumed starters or someone who's going to be challenging for a starting position. It's not the kind of decision making you want to see from a young person who um, now I, I guess I, I would feel comfortable saying is, is starting to exhibit some concerning patterns of behavior. And this is a young person that I think uh, is, is crying out for some help here at Lincoln. What, sure. what are your thoughts when you saw this? Yeah, I mean, it's just it's one thing. I mean, I think there's a lot of speculation about what her status was be going, to, going to be go forward. And then the second incident came out. Uh, her name is not listed in the, uh, the in the case file that was the, the Nebraska, the Lincoln police department <clears throat> so they're still it's under investigation uh we don't know if charges are officially going to be filed against her for that so we'll see what mm -hmm. that but it's it, it's again like you said it's a pattern of behavior that it just raises red flags has you concerned um but like you said she did not play uh in, in the spring game in the spring match on saturday uh we didn't learn about that till thursday afternoon they uh, the Husker Athletic Department's reached for comment about the second situation and said she was suspended from the match 
based on prior incidences too. But uh, and that that came out on uh, was that it was Friday afternoon on Wednesday when we talked to John Cook. We asked him. I asked him directly, "Will Harper be playing?" He said, "We're not going to talk about uh, anybody's playing time." So he basically hmm. said no comment to that. But he said everyone would be available, so everyone was healthy. But uh, Harper, it came out uh, on Friday that she would not be playing. She was suspended from the spring game match too. So uh, then we did talk to him after the match on Saturday. Um, we kind of asked him, one of the first question was, do you have to wait for the legal process to play out before you figure out what your next move is? Cook said, yes. He said it was, it was out of his hands. Um, I don't mm -hmm. know what that means. It's up to the judicial system or up to people higher up than him in the athletic yeah. department. And then I asked him, what's her status right now? And he said he didn't know. So he told who she yeah. he hopes that she finishes finals and that should be her main priority right now, which finals are coming up at uh, UNL as they enter the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of uncertainty around her status going forward right now. You know, you could read that line in, in a couple different ways. And, and I was turning that line over in my mind once I when I heard him say it, when he says, you know, the big priority right now is we just hope she finishes finals. And you could read that as sort of an offhand comment that like that's what's that's just what comes next. I think finals are two weeks away. Um, for the, for the, it's not this, it's not this week that we're in right now. It'll be next week because graduation is in two weekends. Um, and, and that's just what comes next chronologically. Or you could also read that as I'm really concerned about this person. I hope she just continues to finish the semester and, you know, isn't, is it in any kind of spiral that would, that would have her not finish her, her academic semester? Um, you brought up an interesting point, Lincoln. I think there's sort of two different tracks we're looking at here and, you know, we talk about these tracks, whether it's with a football player, basketball player, volleyball player who has some kind of run in with the law. There's the legal um, chain of events. And, you know, she's going through that right now with um, whatever comes legally from the DUI, uh, a shoplifting charge. You know, a, a store can can choose to pursue that legally or they could choose to not press charges. And, you know, whether or not they, they press charges or not, I, I don't think that changes the fact that this happened. Um, and so my guess from, you know, it's out, John Cook saying it's out of my hands. I think the athletic department um, would do him a service by by taking it out of his hands and saying, John, this isn't going to be your decision to make. We're going to we're going to make up our minds over kind of what her availability is going to be athletically. Um, you know, we went through this a couple years ago when, um, gosh, who was the the running back on the football team? Just their legal situation was something stretched on and on for months and it kind of weighed on Scott Frost, you could tell. And, um, and, and the athletic department probably could have done him a service by just taking that decision out of the head coach's hands. Um, you know, I think there probably will, if, if she continues with the program, if, if, um, if she wants to come back and if the team wants her to come back, there's probably got to be some kind of, you know, publicly seen accountability, whether that's a suspension or, you know, you've got, 13, 14 other young women on that team who need to know that kind of there's one set of rules for everyone and uh, some, something has to happen. And, and there's got to be a lot of trust, I think, that probably is going to need to be rebuilt. And we're going to talk about culture here in a little bit. But, you know, the captains on this team now have a, a difficult job um, in kind of figuring out what to do to fix the team dynamic if, in fact, Harper Murray chooses and the, the team chooses to have her continue to be part of the program going forward. Because, you know, when I see someone, uh, a young person maybe making some decisions like this, I call it self-destructive behavior. And it doesn't exactly scream from the rafters that someone is super happy in their current situation. And, you know, just speculating, but this could be someone who's who's looking for a fresh start and and just needs to go somewhere else to to get that start. Remember, this is a, a young person who who does not have family around locally, um, sister and mom live in Michigan. That's where she's from. Um, her story is well chronicled that she lost her father at, at an early age. And so, um, you know, th th there's not just the, the personal support network that's, that's immediately accessible. Maybe, um, yeah. it, I think a lot of the team, you know, is, is going to be that support network if, if that's what she chooses to do. Yeah, and I think even before all of this came out, I know she was having a difficult offseason too. It kind of started after that national championship match where Harper made some comments that they wanted to win the next three, which, again, I don't fault her for that. I, that's who she is as a person that I've come to know, that she's a very competitive person, and they were down in that moment, and I think she kind of uh, said that, uh, spoke her truth, like, 
she was feeling bad. She was going to work hard and come back and try to win the next three. Um, people piled on that. So I think that, that was, I don't know if that is part of this whole thing too, but shows, but that kind of started off on the wrong foot and um, people piled on her. I, I think it was unfairly. I think that don't think that that comment was too out of, uh, out of line with, her emotions, her thoughts at the mm-hmm. time. It was just honesty. And I respect her for that. So speaking her mind as a journalist, I love it when athletes do that and they don't just give you the, uh, give you the uh, cliched answer. So, mm-hmm. um, but it, it's been a long off season for her. I hope that again, she's getting to the support she needs from wherever that is. Uh, but I mean, even after the first incident we saw with the DUI and the other charges, uh, she was still involved with the team. She was still practicing. Uh, she was part of the team outing that went up to uh, CHI to the uh, concert. Um, kind of that. So she was still involved with the team at that point. And I don't know, I assume that the suspension was made because it was made prior to the second incident, which happened on Thursday before mm-hmm. came out on Friday. So th- there's just a lot going on. You Again, you hope that you, you worry about Harper, the person a lot too, and not just mm-hmm. Harper, the football player that she's getting the, the support that she needs and uh, is getting, whether that is time away from the team, time away from the court, but hopefully, yeah, like yeah. you said, it's not like the Maurice Washington situation that dra- 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 that's who I was trying to think of. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think, I think absolutely Har- Harper, the person has to be the focus for, you know, the foreseeable future, regardless of whether she, you know, continues with the Nebraska program or continues playing college volleyball at all. I think this, this is someone who um, needs some help and, and just needs to get their life right and get their focus right. So that um, situations like this don't continue and, and it, you know, can really hinder your future if you're um, if you continue to make decisions like this. Yeah, the one part I you meant you foreshadowed a little bit too is just they they've talked a lot about the team culture and rebuilding it and the accountability. Um, I, I wish that things had happened differently with the, the uh, time wise. Uh, I, I mean, you talk about accountability, but when you have chances to say that we're holding this player accountable, she was not going to participate. I mean, it, it took basically the second incident for like, yeah, she won't be playing even when we directly asked John. I mean, uh, I don't think, I don't know if the public deserves that, but there needs to be some show of accountability. Cause even if she wasn't slated to play, the question is going to come up like mm-hmm. where's Harper? Why is she not playing? Well, we decided previously that she would be sitting out because it, it was going to come to light once the match happened, mm-hmm. if that situation or Dory. So I, I wish that, I don't know. The, the public doesn't need to know what all the punishments, but if you're talking so much accountability and, and team culture, you need to show that to the world as well, too, that no players above it. And she's yeah. part of the program. There, there's a, there's a pretty strong history though. I would say that, that John Cook does not speak openly and in advance about discipline situations like this. And I would say there, there's not a ton of examples uh, over the years. There are a few, but you know, I, I don't, I don't remember him coming out, you know, immediately after an incident and say, you know, we're suspending this person or, or even as far as saying, like, Hey, we're going to deal with this and, and make sure that, um, you know, there will be accountability. We won't necessarily come right out and tell you what all it is. Some will be obvious and some will not be quite so public. Um, so I guess I wasn't surprised by that. Yeah. Um, I would be surprised if there wasn't some kind of action, we just might not be able to see a hundred percent of it up front, and, and, and that's fine. Um, but you know, again, the, I think that's, that's going to play out down the road. We're going to see this obviously in the summer and the fall, there's more to come on this, but you know, for right now, I think it's just safe to say, um, we're, we're hoping that whatever resources they have available to, to kind of help a young woman that, that appears to be in a bit of a crisis, um, it, are, are given to her and, and that, um, she she can be made whole and and just kind of put her life on a on a better path than what it may appear to be going on right now for sure yep that's good so you want to uh smash cut to to carney and the the sports and health center and the scene you saw on saturday moving into rotation two let's talk about nebraska's spring match against denver which happened uh over the weekend for sure yes on a different note uh back to actual volleyball on the court too we've uh, seen a lot of Uh, It's been a while since we've seen the Nebraska team out on the court, too. So their one public spring exhibition match uh, out in Kearney Health Center. Great crowd there. It's still more than uh, 5,000 people. Uh, It wasn't a very competitive match. uh, Nebraska took care of business against a very matched Denver, which Denver only had, I think, 10 people suited up. And um, Mm -hmm. hopefully they get some transfers and get some have some incoming players coming in. But uh, yeah, spring's always weird like that, right? Because some some players graduated or are graduating, 
Some have transferred. Your freshmen aren't usually there yet in most programs. So it, it didn't surprise me that the results were what they were. It was it was not not, not very competitive. It was, I mean, a sweep, uh, 13, 12, 15. I think Nebraska only trailed during two rallies, and that was like 1-0 and 2-1 in the third set. Mm-hmm. So Nebraska really didn't. They went on dominant runs. They weren't really pushed at all, but they still played pretty sharp volleyball and really made mm-hmm. the best of the situation. You gave them a chance to show what they're made of. Um, they were clean for the most part. There weren't a lot of sloppy passes. They were – really efficient in the attack too so um yeah i mean it was they got what they wanted to out of it they mm-hmm. got players back they got the freshmen involved um but it was so it was a success and they took volleyball the nebraska volleyball uh circus on the road out to Kearney. so what, what, what's it out to you Jeff? so yeah i mean th- when i sat down to watch this I'm, i was thinking to myself like okay be careful how much you're gonna take from this because you know, Denver uh, is, is a good program for for their level within their conference or at the top of the Summit League. But like, you know, th- this is not a, a Final Four contender that that Nebraska was going to be playing. And I really do kind of wish if, if you're going to go take this show on the road and and go play away from home in front of a new audience that that you kind of agree beforehand that maybe you're going to play at least four sets. Um I, I think I had heard somewhere that the, the 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 super secret scrimmage with Kansas State they kind of played multiple sets. They play five in five. that, and it's like if you if you have people who are going to come pay money to watch this, like an hour and twenty minutes is is maybe not the most bang for the buck. And I know we're not just talking about this in an, in an economic sense, but like yeah, it, it would have been like you know we got to see Kennedy Order set the whole third set, and I was really happy for her to see that. Why don't we why don't we play a fourth set to, to 15 or 20 and and let her you know get some more time out there? But I mean, some of the my impressions from this was um I thought Bergen Riley looked really good, Nebraska's sophomore setter. Just in the first like 10 points alone, you can see how deceptive she is when on some of the slow motion replays on the broadcast. Um, just her body is so vertical, she doesn't give anything away with her body lean. And mm-hmm. so that gave her, put her hitters in a lot of one-on-one matchups. Uh, Rebecca Alec had a hot start, and a couple of those were off of nice sets from Berg and Riley. Um, Nebraska hit over 400 for the match in the first two sets with with Riley setting before Kennedy Orr took over in game three. Nebraska hit 511. So um, the offense was was rocking and rolling with, you know, I think a combination of Nebraska's talented attackers, Berg and Riley doing what she does, and and then just Denver is not really set up that great to to stop an offense like Nebraska's. Um, Rebecca Alec had a really fast start. Uh, she ended with five kills on seven swings, but she got going early. It was nice to see her. And then, you know, I think Nebraska's middles could be a real strength this year because Andy Jackson, who's as physically impressive as I think we've ever seen a, a freshman last year, you know, was was just as physically impressive. But I was really impressed by some of the range she showed mm-hmm. on her shots she hit a slide uh, down the line. I want to say in game two or game three that uh, I don't know that you would have seen her hit last year because she was, she was really all into that sharp cross uh, court shot on the slide. And once a middle can hit a slide down the line, that's kind of like the last level to unlock on that play. So um, Lincoln, what did you think? I was going to shout out the the best shirt I saw in the stands belonged to uh, Josiah Alec, Rebecca's uh, brother who uh, had a shirt that said, feed the middle, big girls got it, got to eat. So uh, great shirt. And Nebraska really made a point. I think you mentioned how the fast start that uh, Alec got off to. She had two kills in the first three, four rallies. So they really made a point to go to her. So, and you'd love to see that connection between um, Riley and the middles kind of always develop. And I think they really, they really did a lot more with it and forced the issue. Even like, seemed like last year, they waited a lot for the perfect pass to be there, but mm-hmm. it wasn't perfect. Um, Riley was able to really connect with them too. So middles were great. Setter was great. I think the, the storyline of what we really wanted to see and maybe learned the most of was the outside hitters too. Cause one, you had mm-hmm. Lindsay Krause who hadn't played since, well, how play indoors since October and in injury, she had played in the beach season. And then uh, the freshman Skylar Pierce, because those were the only two outside hitters available on Nebraska's roster. So they were really pressed into action. And I thought they both did. Uh, they, they did well. I think that, that was the mm-hmm. kind of, one area where we could learn a little bit about this Nebraska team. Lindsey Krause led the team with 12 kills, hit, hit 417. But it, this wasn't the Lindsey Krause that we saw from most of the last season, too. She was uh, she was really great with her changeup, the roll shots. She found the middle of the defense with that. Um, and Cook said, I, I think you, you, you caught this and tweeted this out, mm-hmm. too, and said on the broadcast that she's about 75% 
of where she was. I mean, 75% of, I mean, she was big 10 player of the week right before that injury too. So mm -hmm. she's still work, working her way back and uh, it was good to see her kind of on, on the court and yeah. get that rhythm of things. You could, you could tell that, that, you know, she's still working her way back. She, she doesn't have like the explosiveness and the high flyingness, or at least it wasn't on display on Saturday. I, I thought, you know, to echo what you said, some of her versatility really came through. Yeah. She had to, to kind of clean up some less than ideal sets, I think, and, and scramble play situations in game three. There was one I remember, I think it was in game two, she sort of had to, to dance out of the way of one of the backcourt players um, yep. during an out of system play. And she was still able to hit this really nice kind of cut shot down the line to the deep corner to score. So that, know, that Lindsay, happened right, right in mm -hmm. front of me, I was like, Lexi Rodriguez saved the ball up and kind of, she had to like mm -hmm. kind of shove her out of the way, but yeah, that was a great, great point for Lindsay. Yeah. So, so Krause had 12 kills. Um, you know, Merritt Beeson is, is pretty much to the point where like, unless she goes off for 25 kills, we're like, ho oh, hum, it's another Merritt, Merritt Beeson match. Well, she looked outstanding. I don't remember Nebraska setting the back row to her. Um, maybe well, I remember, once. I remember once, yeah, and it was hey. nasty. <laughs> well, they they didn't do it a ton. I I think uh, part of that is because you know Murray wasn't playing, and she's another player that that usually hits out of the back row. Nebraska, um, you know, used all of the defensive specialists at their uh at their disposal, both with Lexi Rodriguez, Lainey Choboy, and then we got to see the freshman Olivia Malk, and like I think it's very clear already this team is going to be a really good floor defensive team. And that's one thing, you know, that, that Harper Murray brings to the table that maybe some of Nebraska's other outsides don't is she's a good passer, good defender, but Oh my goodness, do they have these backcourt specialists that are the envy of probably pretty much any team in the country with Rodriguez, Choboy and Mauk. And they made some saves and got some balls up um, against Denver on Saturday that, you know, yeah. they make look routine when it would make everyone else's highlight reel. For sure. That's, that's the one thing I do like about the spring match is we get to sit courtside uh, instead of our loft up in the perch and Devaney center. So we can set up on the moon. Yeah. So we can really see the, the defensive specials. I think that's one, the one thing that I really appreciate about being low is you can hear them talk, see them make those diving saves and they were really good. So yeah, I mean, Lexi played her normal libero for the first two and then Choboy played the third set. Uh, and then Laney, uh, she subbed in for one of the outside hitters uh, and then uh, Olivia Mao. Uh, also played so so none neither of the outside hitters played the back row um, in, in the match yesterday too and they kind of they mix things up in the third set where I think Lexi was a defensive specialist she played the back row for um, Merritt Beeson I think at one point all three of them were back there too and good luck to opponents but mm -hmm. the one thing that after the match John Cook said with we asked him about Olivia and she said when he, he when she first came he thought that there was an option to red shirt her red shirt her and mm -hmm. um I, I think after what we've seen from her and if that and they've talked her up all spring uh that she's gonna play her way onto the court with what she can do and and her first serve in the match was an ace so to have mm -hmm. I, don't know, I don't know how nervous she gets before that uh and 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 also the other cool thing I mean the cool thing for her she had a great match too but she's had a week from hell probably her family was involved in those tornadoes that hit in uh, Western Omaha. What they hit her house up near Bennington is where she's mm -hmm. from and completely destroyed it. She said yeah. that they're going to be out of there for nine, 10 months. So to be able to compartmentalize the chaos that's going on with your family and your home life to perform the way she done the court yeah. was really great. I, I would imagine we have some listeners that are not in the immediate Nebraska area and might not be familiar with this. So ju just real quick, a, a couple of Fridays ago, um, there were some really bad storms that hit, you know, northeast Lincoln and then went up and 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 took out some neighborhoods in the western Omaha suburbs of Elkhorn and Bennington, which are um, pretty fast growing uh, parts of the city. Olivia Malk is from Bennington, which is just north of Omaha. And, um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of families have been affected by uh, by those storms, power outages, storm uh, neighborhoods being flattened and, and miraculously like nobody was seriously hurt. Um, so thank God for that. But yeah, the, her, her family's got a lot uh, that they're going through right now as well. And for her to kind of have the debut that she did um, is, I think, you know, really speaks highly of her focus and and her toughness. Yeah. Um, we got some other things that we want to get to for this match. You know, we, we, we've talked about all these players. We haven't talked about the, the freshman outside hitter, Skylar Pierce. And I know Lincoln, you've, you've 
had a chance to talk to her a couple times and, and feature her a little bit in your writings. Um, what did you think of, of Skylar Pierce's debut? Yeah, it got off to a little rough start. I think her first, her first attack was blocked. I think yeah, she, she was she was stuffed on her first swing. Yeah, it, it was kind of a tight set, so she didn't, she couldn't do much with it, but it it got roofed. So, but I think after that, she really settled down. Uh, really had some great uh, great cross court shots. I, there was one that was just a sharp cut that I think I don't know if it landed in in between the or in front of the ten foot line, but it was right around there. It was a nice shot that really kind of was available to her and she hit it very well. And I she think can I'm hit that. She can hit that four to four shot. So the, the four position on the, on the court as they're labeled is front left. And so when you're hitting from the front left to your opponent's front left is really incredible. Um, if you can pull it off, it's hard to stop. You saw Sarah Franklin from Wisconsin hit that shot a lot last year and it's deceptive. You almost have to hit the side of the ball. You have to hit it off the side of your hand. And so it's a really advanced shot. And she put down maybe two or three of those. So when I saw that, I was like, whoa, okay. This is not just a hang it and bang it freshman. Like she's got some range. Yeah. I, I think that, that that's kind of her set. I mean, she has some power, some punch with a lot of her attacks, but I think she's more of a craftsman and really can uh, place the ball where she wants to wants it and make the defensive work. So I think she really got better as the match went on. Uh, she finished with 10 kills, so a great showing from her. And she admitted she was a little bit nervous, but like like we said, got into a rhythm as the match went on. So really, really good de debut from her. And I think it's always valuable. We'll, we'll see what she looks like in her first match in Devaney. But to get your first match in front of a packed Husker crowd is always a cool, cool moment. So um, really good. I think another another person that everyone, coach and players, really hyped up as having someone who had a really good spring. So a uh, good start to her college career for Skylar Pierce. Absolutely. And then uh, we saw in game three, Kennedy Orr, the senior now. Man, it's weird to say Kennedy Orr is a senior. Um, <laughs> it feels like she hasn't been here that long. Um, but but she's uh, going into her senior year. Uh, she got to come in and be the setter in game three and give Berg and Riley a break. Nebraska still hit over 300. She had some pretty nice plays, I thought. Um, you know, she's she is going to be the backup setter. Nebraska needs a really good backup setter. Um, just, you know, your one injury illness away from from needing that. And I, I thought she was really solid. Um, she put up some some nice hittable balls. And um, I was just really encouraged by by seeing Kennedy Orby out there. And I can only imagine just how um, how rewarding it was for her. You know, by all accounts, the team loves her. She's one of the more popular players on the team. And it's not like she just came in for a couple rotations. She got to run the show in game three. And that's where. You know, if they had played a fourth set in predetermined, I think it would have been great to see Kennedy out there and, and run the show for another set. But I was really encouraged by her showing. Yeah. And the, the good part to me of that, too, is that she came in in the third set, too. I think one thing we saw a year ago in Central City, she started the match. I think the coaches were worried with her with her leg and her knee, especially that she wants to get time to warm it up and warm it up and then to have her stand on the sidelines. I mean, she did come in and was a service specialist for the second middle blocker, but to have her kind of not doing a lot of activity for most of the match and then come in in the third set and run the offense too. I think that's an encouraging sign for her physical well-being and kind of where she is um, with all of that. I know she's dealt with a lot mm -hmm. of problems, but it was, that was a good sign to see, to see that they trusted her well enough. They trusted her body to be able to warm up after not doing much for yeah. her to come in and, and play the setter position, very physically demanding. Mm -hmm. So Nebraska looks like it's going to have a, a fair amount of depth. And, and as we're just kind of looking at different positions, now that the spring season is over, they go into, um, I think I heard John Cook say in his, uh, during the match interview with, with Nebraska public media, that they all kind of come back after the 4th of July, by the way, I, I understand why they do that, why they put the headset on a coach during an exhibition match and just talk to him. I don't know that it's the best television because, you know, the coach is trying to watch the match and evaluate things. And it's so like they're not locked in like a color commentator is. And I just felt like, you know, I John Cook didn't necessarily want to be on uh, on the headset for the entirety of like yeah. game two. He would rather be talking to his players and maybe reacting to what was going on. So that was a little bit of a challenge. But when, once they all come back together after the 4th of July, remember, we've got some new additions coming into this program. Like Taylor Lanfair is going to be here after her um, semester at Minnesota gets done. Layla Blackwell's joining the program, middle blocker from San Diego to add that middle depth. And so you're, you know, outside hitter is really going to be interesting. 
when you've got Krause and Skylar Pierce and <clears throat> presuming Harper Murray, you know, is still going to be in the mix. And then Taylor Landfair, who's transferring in, not really expecting to, to just provide depth. She was going to fight for a starting spot. Yeah. Nebraska's kind of got uh, a lot of decisions that they're going to be need to make and probably a, a good problem to have from the coach's perspective uh, just on that left side. Now, again, this is Taylor Landfair, who was the Big Ten Player of the Year uh, after the 22 season. So she, she's loaded with talent, too. And, and and you could say the same thing for middle blocker, too. I mean, uh, Layla Blackwell was a very important part of that San Diego team that made it to the Final Four, too, uh, in 22 as well. So you wonder, I mean, the way that Nebraska's middles play, and, and I don't know if we've said this, but Rebecca Alec did did take a few a uh, couple months off, didn't play in the beach season. Uh, and I mean, the middle blocker position is just a cold grind. So hopefully Nebraska can rotate a little bit, a little bit more and uh, keep the, keep their players fresh for uh, the late postseason run, hopefully. So mm -hmm. I, it, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if there's a lot of rotating going on or if John Cook finds a starting lineup and sticks with them till one of them hits a funk and then pulls them. So, and I think there's also defensive specialists. I mean, Olivia Mount, mm -hmm. she's going to make a case to get playing time. Yeah, absolutely. And and I always come back to the line that that I heard John say a million times, which is the six best servers will play. Mm -hmm. And so I think Nebraska last year, maybe one of the areas they were not as elite in was just pressuring teams with their serve, not necessarily aces, but like starting the point in their favor, getting them out of system, forcing a, a less than three point perfect pass. If Malk is able to assert herself on the service line, then she's going to play. Uh, maybe it's only that half rotation. Maybe she's a serving sub. But I think that's what they're really going to look for is, is who are your six best servers? Yeah. And maybe that is a, little, a middle blocker. Maybe they let Andy Jackson go back and serve. But um, I, I think that's going to be key on on who sort of earns more playing time from that DS spot. Yeah, and it wouldn't be in Nebraska has used two defensive specialists before too. Back in the when they made the uh, it was a twenty one uh, national championship game. Rodriguez was playing libero. You also had Kenzi Knuckle and uh, Kiana Leakana were all part of the uh, Legion of Boom. I think is what Jalen called them. Um, so I think it's not unheard of for Nebraska to use uh, a libero and two defensive specialists. And uh, it we'll see you again if Nebraska, it, but it also takes away from that back row attack, which Nebraska was an elite program at last year with both mm -hmm. Eric and Harper Murray. So it limits the offense a little bit too, but it spices up the defense. So a lot of decisions. We'll have a couple months to talk about that. So, um, but that's not the only thing going on. So uh, you mentioned that uh, they are, Nebraska will not be back together until July 4th. So we're going to move on to rotation three here. Talk about what's next for Nebraska in the summer. Uh, they're going to be gone because a lot of players are going to be uh, working out with the national team too. So uh, Nebraska has five representatives or four, four representatives um, as part of the uh, Noreka. Is that, is that how you say it? Norseka. Norseka. Norseka or Norseka. I forget which, but the difference is a soft C. Yeah. Volleyball CONCACAF. That's that's yeah. how I just keep referring to it. <laughs> I like it. Uh, but yeah, so they're the you, you under 21 team. Uh, they're going to train for a couple weeks in June out in Anaheim. Uh, there's 20 players invited to that. They'll cut down to 12. Uh, you, a couple, I imagine there'll be a couple Nebraska players, if not three. I, if all four make it, that'd be pretty impressive. But they'll play up in Toronto the last part of uh, June for the uh, the Confederation Championship. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I would imagine Bergen Riley is is certainly going to be on that team. Uh, the other three, you know, Andy Jackson at, at middle uh, is going to be competing for spot, and then two of those DSs, uh, Lainey Choboy and uh, Olivia Malk. So all of them, I believe, have. Um, previous youth national team experience. Certainly Bergen Riley had a match where she set the senior national team. Um, and Jalen Reyes is an assistant coach there. So yeah, I bet you, I bet, you know, you'd find two probably uh, Huskers on that team. And then we, we also haven't gone into, I believe the, the recruits that Nebraska has um, that are not part of the, the Husker program yet, but Tariah Sigler, an outside hitter, and then Campbell Flynn, who is, you know, at this point, the heir apparent to Bergen Riley, um, who is uh, going to be here in what, 2025? Uh, She'll and, be a senior this fall. Yes. Yeah. And she's, she's from the Kansas city area. So she's oh, one of the top. She's from Michigan. Oh, Michigan. I'm sorry. Yes. I was thinking probably of the other setter, 
recruit. My bad. I'm just assuming these players are all coming from Kansas City. Uh, pardon me for for my mistake, Campbell and Campbell's family, if you're listening. But yeah, Tariah Sigler and Campbell Flynn, also part of that um, that 20 person preliminary roster. Uh, Harper Murray was originally, I think, slated to be part of that, but um, when the when the rosters were released last week, she she was not going to be on there. And a, an outside hitter from Pittsburgh has taken that spot, which is probably best for everyone involved at this point. But, um, you know, Nebraska, again, continues not only to recruit from the youth, youth national team programs, but to put some players on those junior national teams as well. Yes, for sure. Yeah. So well, that'll happen. Like I said, they'll get together. Um, they'll have some, a couple of weeks off after the semester ends. So they'll report in uh, mid-June to uh out to anaheim and we'll see we'll keep track of who makes that team that uh, go from 20 down to 12 but uh after that when they get back they'll be helping out a lot with summer camps uh, a lot of busy activity some chance for nebraska recruiting will pick up too so uh that, that, there's a lot going on with the nebraska program too one of the things i we, we talked about a little bit i think in our first rotation but we didn't i don't i'll ask you the question too i, I kind of wrote a story about the nebraska they've talked a lot about rebuilding their culture um, they, we talked to Kelly Hunter. She talked to the uh, Lincoln Chamber of Commerce about that. Uh, and we heard from players too. Merritt Beeson talked a lot about these chain links that they're doing and kind of giving out to them for good team uh, or mm -hmm. task support. Uh, so they're really focused on building that culture. John Cook said that, of course, they're always building the culture too. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean what do you make of that when they say that they're rebuilding? They're not just kind of refocusing on it. They're yeah. rebuilding is the word they kept using. I found it a little curious, honestly, because you could look at it in a couple different ways. Uh, you you lost two matches last year and made the national title match. So, you know, <laughs> the culture seemed to be pretty strong. We heard about all these, you know, your culture usually is pretty strong if you have a number of young players come in and are able to succeed right away. That speaks to a pretty solid foundation. And yet, you know, you can look at what happened after the end of the season and you had four players leave. And so I would be interested in, in hearing from, from someone within the program, were there aspects of the culture that they felt needed to be changed? Or when they say rebuilding culture, does that mean try to take the existing culture and, um, and make sure that it's incorporated with the new players who are coming into the program, which is the two true freshmen and the two transfers? Um, you know, every year you have new personalities and new people added to the mix and you, you have to find it. Every team has its own identity. And so I was, I, I was taken a little back by that on, you know, maybe I'm just parsing the words too much and reading too much into it, but you know, what exactly is needed is, is mental toughness needed is nurturing needed. You know, the sisterhood always has to be strong on, on a women's sports team. Like it, it's. It, that's one of the ways that it seems like things are different in men's sports. You, 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 I've heard coaches talk about that. I'm not just, you know, a, a 40 year old guy, you know, pulling that out of thin air. Like the culture has to be strong. The relationships have to be strong. There has to be a sisterhood in order for the team to reach its potential. And so um, I, I'm not entirely sure what they mean by that. And, you know, I, we're, we're going to see this fall uh, because the, when how long is the volleyball portal open for i still think you know we may not be done seeing yeah. some kind of transition and i've been saying this since like our december shows so this happened yeah. before all of the stuff happened with harper murray you have a couple players who are graduating academically who could decide to go somewhere else for their senior year if they want to and you know maybe it all comes to nothing and everyone we saw on the court on saturday is still going to be there in the fall but you know maybe maybe that's not what happens uh, the, the portal is open right now. It opened on May 1st um, and it's open till May 15th. And I, there was not surprising that no Nebraska players, but now that the spring season had, it, but I've been very underwhelmed by the number of volleyball players that have entered the portal again, too. Uh, graduate transfers had to be in by May or April 30th. So it's, we'll, we'll see if anything happens now that school's out, but, and I don't know, I guess, I don't know if there's any high profile ones. I, I don't think of anybody that hasn't committed that would enter the portal after the season. Cause once you're in, you're in, you're mm -hmm. don't have to enter. You can just stay in that until you figure out what your next move is, or you're going back to where you came from. So uh, that that's the situation too. We'll find out in the next 10 days, if a uh, week, week or so that if any Nebraska player, I, I don't, I'm also on the, I feel like other side, I'd be surprised if anybody from Nebraska left, but 
is anybody else going to come in? I mean, again, we've talked, we talked extensively about the Harbor Murray situation too. Does that force your hand to add more depth besides three outside hitters? And we don't know who's playing back up opposite. So we'll find out that soon enough. Uh, the, the other cool thing, uh, just the last, or I guess got two more things to talk about kind of what, what's upcoming, but uh, the, the cook talk extensively about, about uh, ESPN has been around Nebraska all spring uh, for an E60 documentary that they are going to put out. I think it's supposed to slate in like early September is when they're going to put it out. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's cool. I mean, we, there was a great documentary last fall of kind of about the history up to uh, ending with the stadium match too. So I'll be interested to see what they, that was the BTN production, right? Yes. Yeah. BTN big 10 did that. Um, I, I think uh, from my sources uh, telling me this, I think they're going to focus a lot on that last season, the 2023 um, mm-hmm. I say my source because I mean me because I, I was going to say, are you bar- you're burying the lead here. Like you're going to you're going to be a big part of this, aren't you? Yes, they uh, they, I, they great interview. They're wonderful to work with. They we asked a lot about kind of a little bit of the history, but we really focused a lot uh, about the 2023 and kind of the personnel and what uh, what happened in that kind of the specialness of that season, too. And uh, if it's a jumping off, help jumping off for the sport and where Nebraska volleyball goes from losing in that even though they were kind of one of the uh, marquee teams from last year so you're going to have more nebraska volleyball content coming from espn uh sometime this fall the the big thing that i think also came out of the spring match that we did not realize going into it so kudos to nebraska public media for getting this coup uh during the the spring match on saturday nebraska's non-conference schedule was released and uh i was like wait what (laughs) so i had to like pause the tv and and check this out and you know, at first glance, this is a very tough non-conference schedule. You have some of the big names on there, um, like Stanford. Uh, Nebraska going to play the rematch with them. They're going to host yeah. Stanford, I believe, this year after going out and winning in Palo Alto last year on September 17th. And then this is a match that I don't believe the date is scheduled yet, so I, that tells me it's probably going to be early. But Nebraska is going to go out to Louisville and play Danny Boom, uh, Danny Bus Boom Kelly's Louisville Cardinals. Uh, yes. A lot of people thought that we might see that matchup in the Final Four last year, but Louisville lost in the Elite Eight. So Nebraska is going to play two teams la- uh, that uh, made the regional final last year in Stanford and Louisville. And that, that kind of completes the four This is kind of a four year cycle. They signed a four year deal with Stanford to play home and home. And they're also part of a round robin type of tournament with Louisville and Kentucky. I think they're each playing home mm-hmm. and away. Stanford and Kentucky are playing that. And Stanford and or Louisville and Kentucky are also playing as well, too. So this is the last of the four of that playing at Louisville. And it's also uh, Danny Busboom Kelly's birthday today as we record this on Sunday, May 5th. So yeah, uh, happy birthday, Danny. Happy birthday to the Queen of Blazers, as the uh, Louisville <laughs> account called her too. But l- man, those Louisville coaches love getting after it during Derby Week too. I'm seeing oh, like Dan Meskey oh and his bow tie on at the Oaks, or running around on Thursday with a mint julep cup. Like I yeah. want to go to the. That's one of the things I want to do. I want to go to like Louisville from Wednesday to Sunday of Derby Week and and pull my Hunter S. Thompson routine. Yeah, you know Dan. You know Dan Meskey. You were he oh, yeah. was Meskey while you were coming. Reach out to him. He can hook you up, or we can do a podcast uh, exchange too for a tour of Louisville. That's right. We'll come. We'll come on his show. He can come on our show. I've actually been to Churchill Downs before. I've taken the tour. It's gorgeous. I like Louisville a lot because I like whiskey. So of course you're gonna like Louisville if you like whiskey. But I, I want to go hang out and like wear the wear the jackets, wear find a hat. Like yeah. experience the whole deal. Yeah. Let's look at some of Nebraska's other uh, non-conference schedule. They're going to start the year um, with a couple matches against teams from Texas. I assume Nebraska is hosting this. Um, Texas A&M Corpus Christi, which went 22 and 10 last year, is Nebraska's season opener. And then the Huskers are going to play TCU, which was I, I think kind of the last at-large team into the field of 64 last year. Uh, they were just over 500, but they they won their first round match and made the second round of the tournament. The rest is actually starting the season with three straight teams from Texas because they're going to SMU uh, on September 3rd. That uh, SMU was 26 and seven last year. Really good record. They also were a tournament team making American it to the Conference second round. Champion, American Conference champion, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. And then Lincoln, who would have, who would have seen this coming when we were talking with, uh, with Lee Feinswag last year, but uh, the Citadel, yes. the Citadel who started last year, 23 and zero. Oh, the last um, undefeated team in the country, I think, besides Nebraska. Nebraska is going to host the Citadel on September 5th and then play the Bobcats of Montana State on September 7th. And if you're like, Montana State, who's that? They went 24-9 and last year, uh, a really good record. 
Yeah. Uh, if Citadel goes undefeated 23 and 0 again this year, that will be a major storyline because that, uh, that means that they beat Nebraska and, uh, pulled off maybe the upside of the of upside of the year too. So, yes. um, I was actually, I didn't, didn't look that usually they like to schedule these, uh, Montana States or some other teams. Uh, this is maybe where I should have done. Uh, they got, uh, Carly Heideman, who's from Diller Odell. So it's a nice little, uh, ah, okay. Nice little connection. They like, they like to bring back Nebraska prep players when they go out. So right. She's, she was a freshman outside. Well, and they schedule. I'm pretty sure they scheduled that SMU match because, um, you know, this was back when um, uh, Allie Batenhorst was still yeah. on the team, and they were going to give her a match in in Texas. And what her sister plays there, yep. or played yep. there. It, yeah, it was kind of one of those were, connection, SMU, you know, games. SMU played at here this past year, and there's a whole bunch yeah. of Batenhorst there. Also, I'm scrolling down. Madeline Cyber Siebler, sorry. Uh, she's from Omaha West Side. She was a sophomore outside hitter last year. Uh, I'm, so they, they got a good uh, yeah. number of connections to the Nebraska. Nebraska, So it'd be a nice homecoming for those two mm -hmm. players when Montana State. So uh, you mentioned they, Creighton. Yeah, Creighton will be the, another great matchup. Nebraska's never lost to Creighton. One of these years, it's going to happen. Uh, mm -hmm. Creighton brings back a lot. Uh, and then you got another another darling of last year team that came out of nowhere. The I think the ABCA coach of the year, maybe. Was that was right? It, was J.J. Van Neal the coach of the year? Yeah. For Arizona State, yeah, they made the nice Sweet 16, kind of came out of nowhere. So Nebraska will play them. Uh, they're was also Cook the coach of the year? He was the Big Ten coach of the year. I don't okay. think. Okay. Was he the – oh, my goodness. I Sorry. I've already – Yeah, it's been months. Sorry, he, folks. He was but the, Ava, Arizona State was you – know, kind of came out of nowhere. They made the Sweet 16 last year, and Russ is going to host them on September 13th, the next night. They're going to play Wichita State, who I feel like I've seen 100 Nebraska-Wichita State matches. Um, Wichita State won the the NIVC postseason tournament last year. They were 26-8. and eight. That's like the, the NIT for volleyball. Um, actually beat Montana State in that one. And then they close with uh, with Stanford. And I'm still guessing that Louisville match comes early in the season. Maybe it's even the season opener. I well, yeah, because you, usually they play three <clears throat> matches, but I they were they played those two. Um, I have the calendar yet, but they they played those two Stanford and Kentucky based teams of that. Uh, I also like to apologize. John Cook was the ABCA coach. Okay, Rain Farm. Yeah. I feel it's, like I wouldn't. I, I ran ahead have of on today. Said my, that great. if I didn't. If something like that didn't ring in my brain. Yeah. I ran ahead. Uh, I, I, I think also too. So like, you know, I, I won't put words in your mouth. I have heard just from people I've talked to looking at future schedules. Nebraska is also putting together being in another one of those multi-team tournaments, kind of like the vert challenge they were in a couple years ago. I've heard names like Louisville, Stanford, Texas, maybe Pitt being tossed around in there as well. So I think, you know, going forward, you're going to see Nebraska in in more of those big, high-profile preseason tournaments too. Maybe starting as early as even the 2025 season. I heard that that was a possibility this year. Wisconsin was trying to put together that big uh, showcase for Big Fox. That um, who are they host? They're hosting Texas and uh, who's the fourth team? I forget who the fourth team is, but um, Florida were, maybe. Who knows? Florida or yeah, I forget. Maybe that was Stanford as well too. So. Um, but that obviously didn't happen, but that'll be a good showcase for that. So, uh, yeah, we know the season. We'll probably find out what the Big Ten schedule is at some point in June, um, hopefully sooner rather than later. Uh, but probably yeah. before Big Ten media days. Are you going out to that? I am. I, uh, I have not yet booked my flight, but I have a tab open with hotels and uh, air, air, air flights out there to visit Chicago that first week. Uh, in August, so third annual year, they will have host that. So super size this year because we got Oregon, we got UCLA, we got Washington and USC coming mm -hmm. to Chicago. So that'll be a good time. So that'll happen that first week of uh, August as well too. So absolutely. Hey, let's uh, let's move it along to rotation four. Lincoln, you have been doing some work uh, in speaking with a I will call it a surprise because I didn't see one coming. But Nebraska got a new 2025 commit uh, last week, and I want you to to take the lead and, and tell the folks about her. I will say it was not a complete surprise to me because I think during one of our media availability, sure. Jalen what Jalen was walking her around the complex. So it didn't wasn't intentional. wasn't showing anybody. Was giving her a tour, and we were talking to we were busy talking to whomever we were talking to and he just was giving a uh, a tour of the family so we saw them there um but it took a while but uh so they weren't sneaky about it is what you're saying no they were just giving her a tour they didn't stop and gawk but hope but luckily the uh media horde didn't scare her off so her name is manaya Og Ogbeche. sorry 
Uh, I'm sorry if I butchered that, but Manaya Ogbe. Why do you think I let you be the first to say it? Thank you. That's so kind. That's why I'm mostly a writer. <laughs> uh, but she is a 2025 commit, middle blocker. Um, originally was a Northwestern commit, but Northwestern uh, fired their head coach, Shane Davis, at the end of the season. Um, and I very quietly opened up her recruitment as well. I don't, I didn't see any, she's not very active on social media, but I didn't see anything saying that she's any mm -hmm. little screenshots saying I'm opening it up, but uh, she was available and uh, really a position of need for Nebraska too. Uh, they, they have uh, three middle blockers on this, but Layla Blackwell's only has one year of eligibility left and Re Rebecca Alec will be a senior uh, in 2020, the 2025 season. So um, it, it's really kind of, it, it, the, so Nebraska will have three middle blockers on next year's roster. So it's a good position of depth and really kind of what they need to do after they lost um, Aiden Ames was Aiden Ames. Yeah. I was going to say that she basically takes the Ames spot when yeah, Ames we, decided to go to Texas. Yeah. A week or two before signing day, she defected and flipped to Texas. So um, she, Manaya's kind of, she ranked number 123 overall by prep dig prep volleyball.com a little bit higher as her number 90. But I think from what I, the film I saw on her huddle page, very explosive, very physical middle blocker. And I think too, just in talking to her too, she's a very smart uh, and very thoughtful and intellectual player too. I mean, her other schools, I mean, she was looking at Northwestern and UCLA. Uh, her dad played football at Stanford um, wow. and, and her aunt went to play volleyball at Harvard was an all Ivy, the Ivy league player of the year, I think too, at, at Harvard. So um, just a really smart intellectual girl. And uh, I, I think that she, it's talking to her about the process too. Very decision, very kind of logical about it too. So I think she'll really be a nice piece for Nebraska. It really is. I think her and John Cook will get along very well. I can see the appeal because he's a very curious, very uh, thoughtful type of coach, and that'll fit right, right well with what her strengths are as a player. Mm -hmm. So you, you know you can't you can't teach six foot three. Um, she's got a great leap. It looks like already she's going to physically develop in this program and. I think it's it's going to be really interesting to to watch her uh, and and how she develops because as you mentioned like this is a real position of need Nebraska you know it was going to be kind of thin at middle blocker if they didn't find someone you didn't know if they were going to go out and look for a prep recruit or or possibly look for another transfer when you're in Nebraska that's always an option and so um, Manaya Ogbeje see I took yeah. my stab at it as well exactly. will be uh, a middle blocker for Nebraska starting in 2025. And I will say, yeah, it was a good find by Nebraska. There's not that many 2025 recruits left. I think I went through uh, the prep dig uh, top 150, and there's maybe a dozen that are uncommitted. So uh, good find by Nebraska to take advantage of the situation. And Northwestern thought highly of her, thought she could be a Big Ten prospect, and she is. So good. Absolutely. So that's rotation four. We're going to switch gears a little bit going into rotation five. We had the chance to talk with Renee Saunders uh, earlier last week. Renee is the coach of the Omaha Scut Skyhawks, the nine-time defending Nebraska Class B State Championship. So Renee has built one of the biggest prep dynasties in, Nebra in Nebraska high school volleyball history. And this year, she made her forced foray into being on the other side as, as part of the media when she uh, became the radio color analyst for the Omaha Supernovas broadcast. So we talk a little high school. We talk a little recruiting. We talk a little pro volleyball about the Supernovas with Renee Saunders. We spent about 20 minutes with her, and she was fantastic. And she joins us for our interview in Rotation 5. All right, we move on to our next rotation. We have Renee Saunders joining us. She is the coach of Omaha Scut and also uh, Moonlighting as the Supernova's radio color analyst. Uh, she's coached Scut to nine straight Class B state championships. Is also the 2020 ABC Coach High School Coach of the Year, too. So it's quite the impressive re resume. We're in, uh, in the presence of uh, one of the legends of Nebraska high school coaching. But we're going to talk a lot about Supernova's. has been filling up your spring. Um, so, I mean, welcome to the, welcome to our side of it, being part of the media. I mean, how, uh, how is your first season gone being a, uh, radio broadcaster? Well, first I know what rotation am I in on this? Uh, we're, we've got you down for rotation five, although, okay. you know, things could get moved around. We'd hesitated to say it out loud, but I guess that now was, we're just kind of committed to it. Like, you know, three is my lucky number. So I'm like, that'd be funny if I was <clears> rotation three, that'd be kind of entertaining. <laughs> um, not to ruin your podcast by throwing that out there, but um, no, it's much it's more likely that we're going to ruin the podcast. When I listen, I really, it's like 
it's like chapters. It's cool. I like how you guys do the rotations. So it's enjoyable. I enjoy your podcast. It's been fun to listen to. And obviously my time has been a little busy um, between teaching full time and assistant AD. And we started spring workouts right around spring break in March. Like my plate is full, but I would not change it for the world. Like this, the media side is different and I'm not going to lie. It's weird wearing something that says media on it because I've never been on that side. And it's, it's funny. Cause like, I don't mind the media. I feel like I have pretty good relationships with most of you guys and, and I appreciate what you do. And I know your job is hard. Um, but I really love my job and I love my crew, like the ticket guys, Derek Pearson and Rico Alvarez, Clary Alvarez, they're so great to work with and they make my job so easy. Like I, he's like, you can't screw this up. I'm like, oh, I'm, I will find a way to screw this up. I have never done this before. Um, but they're, they make this job fun. Number one, um, they make me feel like I'm good at my job, which I really, I don't know if they tell me if I wasn't, but I hope that I'm getting better at it. Um, the amount of knowledge you have to have in your head for players you've never seen play before or you haven't played seen play for a long time, or you don't remember them being anywhere but at Penn State or at Oregon, or you saw them when they played for Pitt in the Final Four. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that is in players like Naughty Valentin Anderson, who has been in Omaha, and I had no idea she was in Omaha. I'm like, how have we never crossed paths? Mm -hmm. It was such a small community. Um, but I've enjoyed every minute of it. Um, I'm learning that I don't need as much sleep as I want to get. <laughs> Um, but it, it's hard. It, it's legit hard, but I love it. Um, I, I mean, I hope I'm lucky enough to get asked to do it again. I know that, I mean, I'm, I'm year to year. If they asked me to, I'd probably say yes. And if they don't ask me to, that's okay too. So I'm all right either way, but I really do enjoy it. And I have a lot more appreciation for you guys. Um, learning to ask questions is hard. Mm. Like I I'm used to answering questions. And so I have a hard time framing them. Mm-hmm like knowing what to ask to get the response I want without literally telling them what I think. <laughs> so yeah, sometimes you're off. reverse engineering stuff. My coach brain does not turn off and I try to look at things, you know, pretty subjectively mm -hmm. slash objectively, right? Because you have two teams that are really good um, and just finding out the ways that there, some are a little bit better, right? Is different. Mm -hmm what we're executing while at, what we're not executing while at. But yeah, it's it's been a ride. I, I'm so excited the ride continues in Omaha, though, for the championships. So this is your first experience at, on the media side as a broadcaster. How exactly did you get into it? Did they just cold call you up and say, hey, we have, we've got this idea? And what was your reaction to that? They had like 102 and I was 103. No, I'm, to I'm totally <laughs> joking. They, um, so Diane Mendenhall, mm -hmm. um, I knew her from Husker days. I had actually asked her to be a guest coach um, state week for one of my practices. And she came in and talked to the team and did a little like project with them. Um, I think it was the Thursday after the first round of state that I had her lined up. If we went on Wednesday, then she would come on Thursday. And she came in on Thursday and we talked a little bit about supernovas. Um, Shelton had talked to me earlier in, you know, his, when he got hired about being a consultant anyway for the team. So I was already kind of going to things like I had been to some practices and I had some, some see, seen things on the backside um, of what they were doing, how it was going to work, how the league was going to work. And I think literally they got down to like week, one week to go. And it was like, can you do a zoom with, with Jeff and Jen Ray and I, and talk about this gig. And I'm like, okay, like I can't miss 30 days of school. Like I'm looking at the travel thing. I'm like, I can do the home games. Like I got that. So that's what I was hired mm -hmm. was to do the home games. And then um, Derek was like, we we're going everywhere. We're doing everything. We want you to be with us. So I have not done all of them. There were two road games that I did not do. Um, luckily I don't miss school very often. And so when I came into admin, talked to them and I fly separate from the team. So I'm flying tonight. And then when I can, I come back as early as possible and I come to school from the airport. So I don't mm -hmm. miss as much school as if I were to fly with the team. Like they're already um, in route right now to yeah. Columbus. And so I would have missed today. You know, I think I'm on a different flight back so I can get back earlier from Vegas to get here for the last couple periods of the day. But um, yeah, luckily I'm a mover and a shaker and I, I like to stay in motion. So it's doable, but that's how it all mm -hmm. unveiled. Diane sent me a text and said, hey, would you be interested? And I said, I've never done this before. Yeah. Yeah. Just for clarification, we're talking to you on Friday afternoon in, in yep. advance of the uh, game to, uh, against the Columbus 
Fury on Saturday night, and the the, re- the weird uh, road trip out that also includes a road trip to uh, a flight to Vegas. So the Columbus Vegas road trip, very uh, well known that uh, you get to pull off this weekend. Yeah, it's uh, and it's a big weekend for them. I mean, yeah. they clinch their spot, but they really need to get two wins this weekend. Like mm-hmm. every match mm-hmm. is important for them to stay that number two seed, you know. Or you could look at the other way and be like. So what if we go in a four, let's beat Atlanta round one, you know, in my head, like the, the big part is getting there. We all know that once we're there and it's, it's the fifth game between two teams, anything can happen. And even mm-hmm. if it's up three, one on Omaha and Grand Rapids, I think we're up three run one on them with one match to go at the, and we play them on Sunday night, right. The following week, we yeah. play them on Sunday night. Cause I know I fly back and come to school like at nine 15 in the morning, but, um, <laughs> Then we turn around, we can play Grand Rapids on Wednesday night in the semis, you know, so, so yeah. not a lot of rest. The the Supernovas currently are, are second, and, and there's this weird situation that uh, because of however the league schedule worked out, Atlanta, which has already clinched the number one seed, has played four more matches than Omaha. And so they're done for the rest of the regular season. They're going to sit for two weeks before the, the semifinals come in on, on May 15th. And Omaha still has a chance to to clinch that number two seed, then they've got four matches left. I don't know how exactly this worked out with the PBF schedule, but, but Renee, you had mentioned kind of the start of this, that, you know, you're getting to know a whole group of players and a new team, you know, even though you're the home team announcer, how have you kind of seen this Omaha team grow, progress, change just since they started playing in January? Oh man, they are a phenomenal group of people. Uh, The coaches are great people. The players are great people. And I almost feel like when Shelton created this team, he made it a mandatory thing that you're a good person. <laughs> like mm-hmm. you're a good team player. You understand roles. You understand how to be a part of a winning team. Um, he did a masterful job of putting this team together and coaching staff. I mean, there's four coaches from four very different areas that didn't know each other going into this, but yet they work together so well. So when he transitioned into his new role and Bird moved into the head role, um, Obviously, that was one very big change, and it was early in the season. Um, and then since then, you know, we've had Gina pregnant, which is awesome. Nia with a knee injury. You have Danielle Hart with a concussion, right, where those are three ones, our three big ones, I think, that went out. So we had to pick up some players, mm-hmm. right? So we have changed a little bit. Like, we brought in Maggie King. We brought back Kyla Swanson back, and then we picked up Samity, which, I mean, anybody from Nebraska – knows who Stephanie Samity is. Yes. And it's we, funny. We right? watched many Stephanie Samity matches in Minnesota. So you saw every highlight reel. <laughs> you know, like he literally, my mom, after they played in San Diego, my mom's a big Samity fan. She was so excited when she heard she was coming here. And she literally sent me that night in San Diego, sent me a, a, a YouTube link to Samity's highlights versus Nebraska that year. And I showed it to Steph. I'm like, I told you, my mom, she, you're her favorite. She's like, oh my God, that's awesome. But I mean, it was just kind of cute because I mean, everybody knows who she is. And I mean, she's a great roster addition, but she just, she's another great person brought into a great roster of great people. And I think that it's a very special team. Um, and that's the kind of team you want going into the postseason. For sure. Yeah. I mean, Jeff and I have both been, both been to matches uh, in Omaha too. We've seen them do a great job with the production. They do a great job making it a, a, an energy filled environment too. You've been able to travel to some of the other venues. I mean, how does it compare what other teams are doing? Who else is doing this well to really make uh, an exciting volleyball atmosphere? This is Omaha, right? Like top of the top. And then there's some space and then you've got two, three, four, five, six. Um, I haven't been to Columbus yet, so I'll be able to report back to you on this. Um, Grand Rapids, I have not been to. So those were the two matches early season that I did not go to. Um, I would say my next favorite one that I was, was Las Vegas, small Mm -hmm. arena, great production. Like you're in Vegas, they put on a show. It's like awesome DJ, great music, your ears, you can't, your ears are bleeding. It's loud. Um, not a huge amount of fans. It's way smaller. It's like a 5,000 seat arena. So it doesn't, it's like G league soccer or G league, um, hockey. So it's a small arena, but it's a really cool arena with like a castle feel to it. Oh. Um, so that one's pretty sweet. And then after that, like Atlanta has the best team, but in my least favorite arena, like it's just, mm. it's very bland, yeah. right? Like I'm in the middle of nowhere too. Uh, what'd you say? I'm in the middle it, of well, nowhere too. Yeah. You know, you're 45 minutes from downtown and 
who's going to drive up there on a school night to watch a, a volleyball game. So attendance wise, also not great. I heard Grand Rapids environment was really good. I heard Columbus was really good. San Diego, we played them on a Tuesday night both times. So again, you're looking at a really low attendance, but they were better the second time around because the first time San Diego State was on spring break. Ah, so mm -hmm. they play on campus. Central Florida would be my third favorite that I've been to. That was the Orlando. That's where the Valkyries play. Mm -hmm. um, that one was extra special because I got to see Abby Shomers. So mm -hmm. one of my players is out there. So that was a pretty cool trip for me. But they they did they put on a fun event. Um, UCF does a good job of putting on the Valkyries event. Well, one of the things we've talked about on the show before is you know if you if you the difference between watching college sports and pro sports is in professional leagues the the gap between maybe the top levels of talent and the and the midpoint or the bottom end of talent is actually much smaller than it is in college and so you're not seeing a ton of blowouts there's a lot of close matches <clears throat> it seems like in this league what's been your impression so far just of kind of the overall level of play uh in in the professional league well i teach high schoolers so this is how i explain it to the high schoolers um College is like all your all state players, right? Your all state level high school athletes go to college. Pro is like all your all Americans go to pro. So each year you move up, it's a it's a higher it's a higher level of play at the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. So your worst player was still an all American. And then how do you? I mean, how do you say you're a bad player if you're not, you're an all American, or you're a national team member, or you trained on like the college national team, or you played in like the Pan Am games, or whatever it might be, like. Athletes Unlimited, a lot of the great players play there. So mm -hmm. their resumes are all very polished. Like I know when I first started doing this, that's all I tallied was people that had made a USA roster and Athletes Unlimited. And every mm -hmm. roster had at least four to six of those athletes. Mm -hmm. Then you look at the rest of them and the rest are all, all Americans or they're overseas Olympians, Colombian, Colombian national team, Canadian national team, uh, Puerto Rican national team, Dominican Republic national team, like all these Olympians in one place. Mm -hmm. And so it's funny because you look at, okay, well, last place right now is Orlando. Vegas just moved up on them to get their, they got their eighth win, I think, last night, if I remember right. I think they actually beat Columbus, which I couldn't believe happened. Because yeah. um, I don't know that Omaha to clinch was that loss by Columbus. Yeah, yeah, they needed Columbus to lose one for them to clinch or Omaha had to be, you know, win the next couple or whatever it was. But, um, you know, you look at the bottom team, which is now Orlando. And they're a pretty freaking good team, you know, mm -hmm. like they could, if you look earlier in the season, they beat some of those top teams. And so the, the disparity between one and seven is not very much, you know, mm -hmm. on paper, there's one and there's seven, but in athletic talent, it's like a one inch separation. For sure. Yeah, I, mean, we, I mean, we have a whole podcast de dedicated to volleyball. So volleyball is obviously a big deal and it's a big deal where you are at Scott and you're very connected in, into the high school level in Nebraska too. But we've talked about growing the popularity of women's volleyball this year. I mean, from where you sit, uh, are you seeing that growth uh, and, how, and how has kind of a professional team in Omaha impacted that volleyball community? I think it's, a, I think it's allowed kids to dream bigger than just the high school level, the club level, the college level. Um, you see little kids like I had a five week fundamental K through four that I just got done with last Sunday. And the last day I had two or three kids in supernova Nova jerseys. Mm -hmm. um, last week, uh, Vers at Paisan sends me a text that little kids were drawing the supernova thing on his wall. He's like, <laughs> this cool thing that's happening, right? Like yeah. it's catching on. And what's what I think is making it extra special is we have such a great group of human beings on our professional team that anytime they are in the community, people are attracted to them. So yes, we want to grow the game. We want people to love the game, but we want everybody's quality of like experience to also be better. Right. So yeah. the more they can get out and help kids to dream that there's something bigger out there for them is going to be a good thing. When it seemed like for, for so long, and this will continue obviously too, but having such a, a nationally elite college program like Nebraska in the state, it sort of serves a similar role and gives gives players the uh, something something to really aspire to. And now they have professional teams that they can aspire to. But and Creighton, you know, we'll throw Creighton in there too. And, and Creighton, yeah, and sorry, you know, sorry and about you know, that. Like we had all three D one schools make it to absolutely NCAA tournament this year. So you're looking at like that's pretty crazy alone yeah. to have three teams from three teams from the state of Nebraska with the population that it is mm -hmm. make it into the NCAA tournament is is awesome. And I and, think and, that, that's kind of started with Nebraska, right? Early on, mm -hmm. and reciprocated all the way across the state to every small school too. 
and and we've you know we we talked to Scott Kneifel back in the fall about um, about Wayne State and, and Terry Pettit's talked a lot about how um, it, there was a trickle down effect between the the great college programs in, into high school. What exactly does that look like? You know, from from someone who leads a high school program, how how does this affect just you know the youngest level of players who are just getting into the sport all the way up through high school players who who now realize that there are, there's future for them potentially beyond the end of their high school career. I think that anytime you have, you can see, so like when you walk into CHI, where do you normally see there? A concert or men's basketball, mm -hmm. correct? Now you walk into CHI and you see 11,000, 12,000 people there for a women's volleyball game. Or if Creighton plays Nebraska in volleyball, obviously they see it too. But mm -hmm. now they're seeing it like outside of what their comfort level. So Creighton, Nebraska, people are going to support Creighton, Nebraska either way. Um, the Supernovas have now provided like, oh, I don't have to play for Creighton or Nebraska. Like I could come back and play for the Supernovas and people will come watch me play too. Because Nebraska just embraces. How do you get 92,003 people in a football stadium to watch a volleyball game unless you actually embrace the sport and embrace the culture and embrace the people? You know, no, no other place could do that but Nebraska. And I think that that's why Omaha is such a great place to have a professional team because people are looking for things to do number one, but number two, they're looking for positive influences and positive impacts for their kids. And I think that the supernovas provide that. For sure. For sure. Yeah, we mentioned it in the beginning. Um, you've won nine state state championships too. I mean, but I imagine over that time period, the level and the, the talent level and the skill level has, has not remained consistent. I mean, how has it changed over the last decade? I imagine it's, it's improved. I mean, have you seen just the growth of youth volleyball push up the level of high school volleyball in the state? I think it's starting to get there. It comes with ebbs and flows. Like oh. there's definitely classes that are more talented than other classes. And that's normal. Like there's a normal ebb and flow to the game and you're going to have, you know, that Lindsey Krause class that I had here was ridiculously talented. Mm -hmm. And last year I only had one senior who was pretty darn good. But again, I didn't have six players going on to play college volleyball in one class out of seven and then only have one. So it's ebbs and flows for sure. But where I'm really seeing it is like the really young age. Mm -hmm. So like I just got done with that little kid clinic and we ended the last day with the last 10 minutes. They played their parents and they were like kindergartners getting like two hits in a row, like kindergartners. Okay. Yeah. And then you have first graders and then you have the advanced like second through fourth and they're able to like pass that hit. I'm like, I didn't even know what a volleyball was when I was in second through fourth grade, mm -hmm. let alone be able to actually like serve it over like overhand serve mm -hmm. and like pass a ball thrown to me to a target. Who's going to set it right. Like, it's, it was, it that was, that's when I realized that the trickle down is more like the younger kids are getting better. Right. Which then we mm -hmm. hope my big thing is I'm, a, I don't like burnout. Like I, there is a such thing as too young. Right. I don't think they should mm -hmm. be in clubs until they're later on, but like for a little five week clinic, I think it's good for them as long as they keep doing other stuff. I don't want to be the part that's like leading to burnout. Cause I played it in kindergarten. Yeah. So right. it's Peter's oh. better there, but yeah, you definitely see the the skill level is definitely increase at that younger level. Yeah. So are you see are are you seeing that from from the players who enter your program as as freshmen are they more polished now and more it, technically skilled than they would have been maybe 10 15 years ago? It depends on their prior experience. <clears throat> you know, some of them have a lot of prior experience with high level clubs and some of them have zero experience other than homeschool or YMCA or they just played it in PE class. Like I mean it's every range. Like and it depends on the class we have. Like there's some classes that have Quite a bit of talent and there's some classes that are very raw and need to be developed so it just depends mm -hmm. well your program has has certainly got to the point where you're looking for lots of challenges from them you know you you, you don't lose very many matches when you play against teams especially at the class b level but certainly on the in-state level last year you guys put together a national schedule you're playing teams from florida and kansas and illinois what kind of what, what was the point where you decided to do that what did you hope that 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 challenges that would provide your program that that maybe you weren't going to get by by just playing an in-state schedule um it, it did not start with just playing an in-state schedule wasn't enough i feel like people say like you're you think you're too good well no it has like we could totally play an in-state but the amount of play people who won't play us it just annoyed me so i'm like fine i'll go find somebody who wants to play us and if we lose we lose i don't care right like mm -hmm. i'm not going to stress out about winning and losing um i'd rather we lose in all honesty, I think we lost, what, 12 games last year? 12 Something matches. like that, right. 12 yeah. or 13. 
okay, I'll lose 12 matches. I'm okay with that. But it started with, I think it was Brooke Haney and Ellie Shomers, senior year. The only tournament we went to was this Catholic school tournament down in Kansas. It was the year we went undefeated in 2016. We finished number two in the nation. And it was because we didn't play a national enough schedule. Hmm. So then I was like, okay, who got first? Mother Macaulay. It just happened to be literally Mother Macaulay emailed me the next week and was like, hey, would you guys want to come to Chicago? This is how it started. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, yeah, absolutely. We want to go to Chicago, you know, like, yeah, bring it on. Let's go. So then we started going out to the Mother Macaulay tournament. Um, and that was our only out of town tournament. Yeah. Um, we didn't do the Kansas any one. We do the Skyhawk one. But that was our only out of state one. Then I don't know, five, six years later, post COVID, Florida reaches out. We'll pay your entry fee and we'll pay for rooms. Okay. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not like I'm looking to go out of state, but if it's being offered yeah. mm -hmm. and the school will support us and side note for anybody listening, the school pays none of it. <laughs> zero. I get $0 from Scott Catholic. It is all money that I've raised through my program to go on these trips and we pay for all the airfare and all the hotel for the kids and all the travel. Yeah. So if the parents want to go, obviously they have to pay on their own way, but we cover everything from when mm -hmm. we, the moment we leave to the moment we get back. Um, and I think people think like Scott pays for us to go and they don't. It's mm -hmm. very much like I have to work all summer so that we can do these things. Well, I remember that this, you know, the first time I was ever exposed to something like this where a Nebraska based high school program was was sort of playing some national uh, teams was it was about 10 years ago when I think it was Papio South. They played yep. uh, Assumption out of Louisville. And yep. then I think they might have had Tory Pines out of is it San Diego? Yeah, like, but it was that one were, that was. They were the yeah. two best high school programs in the country that that yep. came to Omaha. I'm pretty sure, and it was a great showcase. Kind of opened my eyes that something like this yeah. uh, was even possible. And then a couple of years ago, I think Papua <laughs> South redid that, and they played like a Utah and a, a California team. Mm -hmm. And then before that, when I was in high school, Lincoln East went out to Chicago, mm. and played in that Macaulay invite. Yeah, basketball does it all the time, and now you're starting to see it come to to volleyball. Yeah, it's just a matter of, you know, it's a matter of obviously at working with your schedule, um, making the money to do it. Um, there's lots of different ways to do it. I'd like to do, I don't know, I kind of feel like the, treat it like a college team, right? Like you take care of it and get them out there and make it a great experience and and learn in the process. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's why we do it. Yeah. I, I was thinking that Mother Macaulay team back in 16, that might have, Kayla Caffey went to Mother Macaulay, so that might, might have been her era. She might have been a freshman at Missouri already starting her first first eight years of college, but uh, as a name that Husker people may recognize as well. Yeah. And then I think prior to pri prior to, Oh, not Michigan state, but Kathy George was also at mother yeah. Macaulay oh, like yeah. early in her career. Really? So, and my, now, it's... you know, Kathy plays for Kathy at Grand Rapids. So yeah, the volleyball world is not very big. No, for mm -hmm. sure. But yeah, it's one more question. We'll get you out of here so you can catch that flight uh, flight out to Columbus tonight. Uh, but we, we get a lot of questions about NIL because I think there's a lot of uncertainty. It's always changing. I mean, and how it's just impacting the landscape of college volleyball. I mean, is that something that your high school players talk to you about, whether that's part of the recruiting process for them, or has that kind of infiltrated the high school ranks at all? My conversations about NIL are none, honestly. Like, I don't even really – ask my kids that are in college what they make on NIL. I also don't ask my kids if that's part of their decision because I hope to God it's not part of their decision because I think things that are bound by money don't end well in the long run. Mm -hmm. I really don't. I think like we have to learn that there's things more important than money. And I'm not sure if we're teaching them that if they're making a million dollars in college. Mm -hmm. there's a chance they're probably not going to make a million dollars when they get out of college unless they're your male high profile Mm -hmm. athlete. So I'm a very like old school person and maybe I'm a little jealous that I didn't have NIL when I was in college. Um, but at the same time, I'm glad I didn't because I feel like there's, you just base your decisions on things other than money. If mm -hmm. that's the case. Well, we, we have talked to, to college coaches about this on the show. We talked with John Cook about, uh, you know, NIL complexities um, back in January. I thought it'd be interesting to talk to a high school coach about, you know, whose who's players probably have a great deal of trust in them. Is it is it part of what what freshmen and sophomores are are talking about with, with you on, hey, I went on this recruiting trip and the facilities were great and the teammates were awesome. And oh, by the way, they said I could make forty thousand dollars or whatever the number right. is. Um, if it's not happening now, I would imagine that it might start happening in the next uh, couple of years just because it's another factor that um, right. that players are going to have. 
right? And but, I think volleyball kids, the volleyball kids are in a little bit different time scale as far as like visits and stuff. So like our, you know, sophomores can start actually talking to colleges on June 15th. Yeah. And okay. they can't take an official visit, I don't think, until their senior year, but they can go visit campuses and do camps prior to that. Um, of mine, my kids currently, I have six 2B seniors, probably three or four of which are looking potentially playing in college, but haven't made a final decision yet. Uh, one has made a decision. She's going to Colorado. Um, mm -hmm. The other three that I think want to play have not made a final decision yet. Um, they've not, one has mentioned NIL of my mm -hmm. sophomore class. I have multiple kids that are obviously looking at playing the next level in that class. And same thing, not one of them have mentioned NIL. So mm -hmm. now I think if, and the funny thing is, is I normally like kind of am pretty proactive about getting them ready for every type of thing they could be walking into, like situation wise with coaches and, you know, things that would be warning signs or not warning signs. NIL has not crossed my mind because I don't think I have technically flipped the switch that it's in, it's technically it's mm -hmm. there, right? Yeah. Number one, and it could make a major impact number two. Um, mm -hmm. I have fears with NI with NIL and women's sports, um, you know, just because I feel like if university are expected to, su to sustain a large amount of money, why don't they just pay employees, right? Make mm -hmm. the athletes employees. But if athletes become employees, then you don't have to app offer equal opportunity to females and males. Mm -hmm. you know, title IX. So m the side of me that's like looking out for women that maybe in the long run, is this going to be a bad thing? It scares mm -hmm. me a little bit. You know, but heck, power to those kids that can yeah. that can make it work right now. So, and I think and, they do a good job of helping them along that process. And we think those changes are probably coming sometime in the next two to four years, most likely. We're going to find out if if those fears are are justified or realistic or right. not. I think, so, well, it depends. It's coming. It depends if government runs yeah. it or if the NCAA makes a plan to fix it. You know, yeah. so right now it's all mm -hmm. there's all yeah. sorts of lawsuits that are in the hopper and being settled and that could change a lot but courts could also have a big say about yeah. things as well too right and that's why we have the media like yourself so you guys can keep me updated <laughs> on those things so i can coach yeah <laughs> yes. we i we had a whole i don't know i don't i forget what month it was but i had a very long like monologue on this show a couple months ago about nil and and, and student athlete employment and all the complexities that come in that unionization and title nine it's wow. like it is, it is not, it is sort of a hornet's nest. And I think we're going to, it's going to fall on the ground sooner or later. And we're all, everyone's just going to have to figure it out. But Renee Saunders, head coach of Omaha Scut and uh, the radio, radio color analyst for the Omaha Supernovas. Thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a great discussion. We'd love to have you back sometime and travel safe uh, this weekend through, and through the end of the PBF season. Thanks for helping, having me on number one and keep putting out that great content. You guys do a good job. Awesome. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. All right. Thanks again to Renee Saunders for joining us on ro in rotation five. Uh, glad she's part of our team now being part of the media. So we're going to wrap this up and stay with the supernovas as we talk to uh, coach Saunders about that. Uh, we're in the final few weeks of the PVF season uh, and big news for the Omaha supernovas. They got picked up that win that kind of match. We teased a little bit with uh, Saunders and they won uh, at Columbus, got a four set win and that gives them a, clinched they, they, i don't know if it was mathematical at this point too but it's official now they have clinched one of the four postseason spots for the uh, final four that will be in omaha in mid-may too so it was a great night from them they first that was really close uh but they won the next three uh betty de la cruz doing what she does put up 21 kills uh also a great night from brooke nunaviller and stephanie samity continues to find her role with the team as well too so yeah absolutely we've seen you know if, if you're a fan of nebraska and you've watched them for the last you know 10 years or so stephanie samity was always kind of a boogeyman for the huskers uh pl the great opposite for minnesota and it's it's kind of nice to see her in a local team jersey now uh putting balls away especially on those back row shots it seems like she hit about 10 of a match so uh and omaha i think mathematically clinched a spot in the in the four playoff spots before beating Columbus on Saturday. Now what they're trying to do is clinch the number two seed. So Atlanta uh, is is clearly the class of the league record-wise right now, 19 and five. They're the, going to be the number one seed. But because of a weird quirk of the schedule that we mentioned when we were talking with Renee Saunders, um, Atlanta finished their regular season on May 2nd, and Omaha will have played four matches 
between when Atlanta, their regular season finale, and when the, the playoffs start on uh, on May 15th. So not only did Omaha play a couple of days ago on Saturday, they're playing on Monday night in Las Vegas, and then they have a home match, I believe, on Thursday, and then they play another road match on Sunday to end the regular season. And that's um, the following week is when the playoffs start with, with the semifinals on Wednesday. So I'm not entirely sure how this uh, happened with the with the PVF, the, that Omaha is going to play four matches uh, and, and possibly earn the number two seed after the number one seed finished the regular season. But I don't know if that's an advantage for them or a disadvantage for them. Um, the rust versus rest or the rest thing. That they right, talking. exactly. See what plays out. But, so... It yep. looks like the other the uh, Atlanta and Omaha are, are going to be two teams in. I don't believe anyone else has clinched yet, but there's three yes. teams fighting for it. Uh, Grand Rapids actually did clinch today on Sunday afternoon. Okay, uh, they ended up beating. I think it was a San Diego. They just played. I just looked at this. Sorry. Uh, they, yeah, they beat San Diego. So they have clinched a spot. They're 11 and 12, so not even 500. They have one more match left, but they clinched a spot too. Uh, there's so that's who Omaha is. They're chasing Omaha. There's one spot left, yes. and I think it's going to come down to either San Diego or Columbus. Right. Uh, who's going to win that final sprint of the last uh, week or so? So uh, Atlanta and Omaha are the only two teams in the league that are over 500. San Diego is really kind of an interesting story. Uh, they started the season one and five, the Mojo, and um, and they they beaten Omaha recently in five. They uh, they have turned their season around, and now they're fighting for that last playoff spot. So it looks like then Atlanta is going to play either Columbus or San Diego in the semifinals on May fifteenth. That's a Wednesday night. That means that uh, Omaha is going to play Grand Rapids. Do I have that right? More than likely, yes. I think there's they need to win their last match too, but those teams will beat up against each other. I think it's more than likely than not they will play Grand Rapids okay. in the two three matchup. And all of those playoff matches, the three you're going to have, the two semifinals and the championship match on Saturday, May 18th, will be at CHI Health Center in Omaha. Uh, tickets are available. You can you can get them through the Supernovas website. You can get them through the Pro Volleyball Federation's website. But um, I think it's pretty clear with the crowds that Omaha has drawn this year, well over 10,000 a couple times, that this was the place to put the semifinals and finals uh, for, for the league's first year. So again, uh, this will be before we record and release our next show the semifinals will be on wednesday night may 15th at chi health center then a couple days later the championship match will be saturday may 18th and we will be talking about those matches and, and have a recap of the first pdf season on our next show which will likely be released in either late may or early june yep and those matches are also available on cbs sports network so kind of nice for them to get on a uh, big national uh cable network too so you how about can... dan gilman getting the call of the supernovas match on on saturday night a uh, former show guest yesterday. yeah so good to see him he did a great job on that call uh working that he also was calling the uh, men's championship uh indoor championship was a spring tune i think long beach state won that i think no ucla I think. ucla they played long beach so yeah it, every year, it's either UCLA, Long Beach State, or Hawaii that wins the men's national championship. And the, the final was in Long Beach. Maybe that's why you said that. But uh, UCLA Bruins um, winning winning the men's national championship over the weekend. Congrats to the Bruins. Future, Absolutely. Can, they, can the Big Ten count that yet as a, as a title for their? Ooh, maybe. That's a, <laughs> no, I think maybe the Pac-12, like, even though they've been legally dissolved and One more are, are, are the property of... A, Oregon State and Washington State at this point. Yep. I think uh, UCLA gets to, and John Sparrow gets to hold on to the national championship. I don't know how many titles he's won now. Like, he's probably won seven or eight national championships. Somebody yeah. somebody, get at us on social media or, or email us at volleyballstate at gmail.com and let us know how many men's championships UCLA has won. But, man, that guy, who is also the, um, the men's Olympic team coach, I'm still pretty sure, do, doing double duty with UCLA and – and Team USA has the chance to to have a pretty good summer if the men perform well in Paris. Uh, yes, by my count, he's won f four as a coach, won three more as an assistant, and won two as a player. So he's got a whole bunch of a uh, whole bunch of uh, yeah. championships too. So great for them. Excellent. Great. Hey, you want to check out uh, some of the merch that we have and support the show? We're in your Volleyball State shirt, your Justice for Libero shirt, uh, Bald Set Spike, also my personal favorite for obvious reasons. You can find all that at herdatsports.com slash shop. 
Um, your funds go to support shows like this and all the other great shows in the Herd at Sports family. Herd at's been very active around the Omaha Supernovas first season. And I know uh, there was a lot of chatter from the Herd at team out for uh, Nebraska's uh, spring match out in Kearney this weekend. So look that up again at herdatsports.com slash shop. We would also be very, very grateful if you subscribe to this podcast and gave us a five-star review. That's going to help grow this platform, grow this community, bring more people into the sport of volleyball, especially from our unique uh, portion of the world that we'd like to look at it from. So please subscribe and review. Also subscribe to us on the Herd at, or subscribe to the Herd at Sports YouTube channel. Go ahead and leave us some comments there as well. Uh, and and this, is, this doesn't have to be a one-way street. You can give us show ideas. You can give us guest wish lists. You can tell us everything we screwed up and got wrong about. Um, just you, we love for this to be a two-way conversation, not just between me and Lincoln, but between every one of you that's out there in the volleyball state universe. For sure, yes, and don't forget to follow us on socials at Volleyball Pod. Uh, email us out, yeah, email us, and you can find me at, at Lincoln underscore VB on Twitter. If you're into threads, I'm Lincoln A underscore VB. And Jeff, they can find you at once again, you can find me at by Jeff Sheldon. That's B Y Jeff Sheldon, just like a byline Lincoln. Tell us who produced the show today and take us out of here. Oh, yes. Thanks to uh, Brandon TD Man uh, for producing today's show. And again, thanks again to Herd Out Sports. You can watch our beautiful faces on YouTube if you're listening to this. Uh, we thank you that and uh, follow us on social and YouTube. And thanks for living in the volleyball state.